All right, this is a message for um, the AUW students who are and aren't here. Um, you had a holiday. Um, so technically you, um, you wouldn't have to put that day in your post. I would prefer definitely that you definitely read the material because it's all related, right? It's Euthyphro, Apology, Crito. And so they all really fit together. Um, so if you wanted to read it, but not do a post that week, there are 10 posts due and there are not, there are more than that weeks. So that could be the week that you don't hand one in. It's really up to you. Um, but I do hope that you read it or you have read it because I'm going to refer to it quite a bit in this lecture. Um, all right. Okay. So I'm going to start out. Um, I've, and I, I want you to think, okay, everybody has an opinion now, I think about whether they think Socrates should escape or not. And so I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna give, you know, Crito's version and Socrates version. And if you wanna add some extra notes that either reinforces, here's another reason why, here's another reason why, or if you wanna change your mind. So, just take notes, um, think about it more, and then I'll put you in groups. So here, this is theater, right? <laughs> I, I like playing these guys, right? Ha, ha. Okay. So I am Crito now, right? Okay. Let me tell you, you just read about that night before Socrates was killed, when I went and I tried to save him. And boy, am I mad. I mean, he wouldn't even go. This was the last straw, the absolute last straw. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of background and all the things that got us to that point and all the things that got us to the death of Socrates. And I cannot tell you <laughs> how annoyed I am and will always be about that. So first of all, I loved my city state as much as anybody and Athens was great, right? We were number one. We had all this culture, we had, uh, you know, all these people coming from all over the world. We had the Agora, we talked and talked about stuff. It was great. We had symposia. So I, I absolutely loved my city state. And then we defeated the Persians. We were outnumbered eight to one. Yay. <laughs> well, then those dang Spartans, right? Those barbarians all they care about is war they don't allow immigration or emigration they send all their little boys to military school all they value is success in war which is barbaric right and so of course we should defeat them we were the stronger ones we had every reason to win and then we lost we lost the war Oh my gosh, that was awful, okay? That was bad enough. Then we go and have this election where we elect one of them, one of those awful conservatives, Critias, and he acted like a dictator. And he was my political enemy, right? Obviously. Well, then he lasted nine months. I mean, he banished or I helped get out of the city a whole bunch of my political friends because otherwise we're going to kill them and then they eventually came back okay and we overthrew Critias all right 
So we set up a democracy once again. We were having trial by jury. We were having an assembly. We were pulling ourselves back together. Then those lousy conservatives brought Socrates to trial and blamed him for why we fell apart, right? It was because he had all those youth roaming around listening to him criticize the authorities. It was his fault that the youth didn't respect authority. It was his fault that the city started to decline, which of course is a complete joke. <laughs> Uh, Socrates was the nicest guy in Athens, like he was honest, and he would talk back to the liberals and the conservatives. None of them liked him, in some senses, because he always spoke his mind, and he was always critical. He kept telling those liberals that they're too self-indulgent, and that they should buckle it up and develop expertise and use that expertise for the well-being of other people. And some of those liberals were uh, underachievers and he would get after them. Some of them were self-indulgent, greedy, he would get after them. They couldn't hide behind their political position. They couldn't say they're good because they're a liberal, okay? Then he, the, then he would get after the conservatives or the conservatives would get after him. <laughs> because he would force people to be transparent and accountable. He wanted democracy. He didn't want powerful people able telling the people what to do without transparency or accountability. That's a conservative position. You know, the masses, they don't understand. They just have to obey. No, Socrates made them accountable. So. So he went after the liberals, the conservatives went after him. All right, so then, um, well, oh my gosh. First of all, I could have gotten Socrates a very good lawyer, I right? have money. I could get him the best lawyer, he would have gotten off. All he had to do is, well, he had the lawyer that would appeal to all sorts of uh, whatever, he had studied someone who had really studied rhetoric and know, knew how to win an argument, then he could obviously have brought in his little kids and appealed to pity. I mean, that always works. It was a no brainer. He would have won, but he didn't. Like he wouldn't let me pay for a lawyer. He defended himself. Oh, <laughs> then the stuff he said, you know, he said, you know, if you, if you tell me that you'll let me off, as long as I stop acting like this, I won't stop acting like that. I'm going to always make people accountable. Socrates, you're trying to get yourself killed. What is this? You have a martyr complex. You can't tell the jurors that. They just think you're being arrogant. And um, then I offered to pay a fine, right? Socrates said, if you just find me, uh, I don't have any money. But then, okay, I saw Crito raise his hand. Okay, he'll pay. So there are people who like me, they'll pay. But even if I pay, I'm not going to stop acting this way. Socrates, ah, <laughs> all right. So then, the people who voted against him knew that I was gonna come and let him go. They never thought he was actually gonna get killed. Nobody thought that because nobody respected the laws, liberal or conservative. They would always bribe, bribe somebody and get, if they couldn't get a good lawyer, they would just bribe the guards and get him sprung out of prison. Um, so, so nobody who voted against him thought it would actually happen. They, they knew that I was his friend and I was perfectly happy to do that. 
Um, and so I'm, I'm a big guy in Athens, right? I'm successful. I know how to gain people's trust. I know how to uh, get money, exercise power. I'm one of the one of the in crowd, right? And so, of course, um, one of the things you do if you have power and money is you use it to help your friends and harm your enemies. I mean, what else is power and money for? So, um, so I was all ready to do it. And then I saw the ship coming from Delos and I knew that as soon as the ship came, they were gonna um, kill Socrates. This is an old tradition in our country. We don't do it when the ship is gone. So, okay, that night I go and I um, bribe the guard. Then I go, Socrates is sleeping like really soundly. How can he be sleeping? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't understand that guy. But anyway, I do. Um, I had a whole list of arguments that I gave to Socrates. I had planned ahead and I, I had my list of arguments because I know Socrates likes arguments. So here we go. First of all, I don't want to lose a friend, right? Socrates, you're my friend. I have the means. You're out of here. All right. Second of all, if you don't escape, people will think I was too cheap, right, to get you out because they know I'm your friend and I have money and they know anybody with money can get somebody out. So no problem, Socrates. Let's go. Um, third, um, if you're worried about your friends, okay, so I had talked to Simeus, Sibis, they came with money also. So a lot of Socrates' old friends were coming, we're gathering together, we're planning the escape, and we're all gonna be heroes. Like we know that we could be banished or arrested for helping Socrates, but that's okay. We wanna be heroes because we believe in Socrates and that he was unjustly accused. Um, then I had friends in Thessaly, so I had it all planned. There was a ship in the Piraeus. You bribe the guard. I had people who could get him down to the port. I had a ship there. He was in Thess. Would get to Thessaly. I had my contact and my friends in Thessaly. They had a place for him and his family. No problem, right? Um, then. I also had the argument that, I mean, and this is true, if you stay here, you're admitting that you're a criminal, right? If you stay, our political enemies are gonna say, you see, he admits it. He himself admits he's wrong. Um, and so we can't, you can't let these bad guys win, right? And then the last reason, the reason that really got me is that he's betraying his children. Like he has little kids and he has a responsibility. If you're a parent, you have a responsibility to take care of your kids. And he was going to desert his kids, right? They were gonna be orphans. And in our society, orphans don't do very well. So um, those were all my reasons. And I thought they were really good reasons. Um, and, and I was perfectly willing to spend the money, to be the hero, to risk arrest, um, to help him get his family to Thessaly. He can still be a dad. And so uh, nobody expected him to get killed. Everybody would understand. It's not a problem. All right. Those are my arguments. Okay. Now I'm going to be Socrates. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So when I heard that the ship was coming, I knew that Crito 
I knew I was going to see Crito because I knew Crito would come and he would try to help me escape. I know that because I know him. <laughs> um, Crito loved me, but he did not understand me. I could have said, told him a million times, it's never right to do wrong. I mean, I did tell him a million times, but when push comes to shove in the critical moment, of course you have to get out of here. <laughs> that, that, all that stuff is fine until your life is at stake. And then shh, we're out of here, right? Well, the thing about Crido is that he was successful. And in order, and that was his goal was to be successful. <laughs> and if that's your goal, you have to compromise. You have to, you know, fudge. You have to make adjustments at various times all the way along. And um, also, if you're going to be successful, you have to worry about your public image. You always have to be thinking about what other people are thinking. Because if you get the rumor mill against you, you're not going to, you're going to lose money and power. Um, that's why at the in the apology right at the beginning, I said, my worst accusers are the rumor mill that's been going on for decades, right? I knew that people were saying things about me. Um, and I knew that the jury knew that and they were thinking about those things. They weren't gonna stay focused on my argument, which is my way of life. But still, it was the right thing to do. Um, so what did I say to him, right? And it's not, the things I said to him were what I always say. They weren't anything new. So let me go over those. And then you have to decide, right? Um, so here it were my responses, right? Okay, a good person doesn't worry about what they think, right? If you worry about who, what they think, you're never gonna be guided by reason. You always have to ask, what do I think is right and why? And definitely you should talk to good people so you can get your thoughts straightened out. You don't, you, you know, you shouldn't do this in a vacuum. But we have a capacity to understand good and evil, and we should always use our reason, our mind. We can't worry what other people think. Other people will think whatever they want to think, whether there's reasons or not. A good person will never allow reason um, to be corrupted by pressure from others. Okay? Not mere life, but the good life. An examined life is the life worth living. Okay? Compromise. You start compromising and you can't stop compromising. If you compromise here, the people who forced you will make you compromise again. You just stop. You just say, I want to live an examined life. A good person never does wrong intentionally, right? Of course, I'm sure I have done wrong but I didn't do it on purpose. I didn't know, or I didn't think I know the better and then choose what I thought was the worst. Sometimes what I did was what I thought was best. And later on, oh my gosh, I was ignorant. I didn't know certain things. If I'd known that, I would have made a different decision. But that was not true when it came to the trial or my defense at the trial. I never had my daimon telling me, whoops, Socrates, no, you made a mistake. Nope, not on this. On other things, yes, I've made mistakes, but not on this. Um, and I told, right, I'm never gonna act against what I believe is wrong. And I will examine my beliefs. But once I come to a conclusion, if nobody can persuade me, I can't go against my own mind. I'll never injure anyone, right? 
and I'll never retaliate because that all of these things undermine social stability, whether you're in a democracy or not, any society, but especially a democracy. These things, these principles that I have are what every citizen in a democracy has to have in order for the democracy to work. What Crito said showed that we didn't have a democracy. Our citizens did not respect the rule of law and the rule of law is the foundation of a democracy. We only appeared to have a democracy. All we had were a bunch of tyrants fighting for money and power, using the system as much as they could. Nobody respected the rule of law. Um, a good person recognizes the following truths, that we need a system in law of law and order. If the citizens behave themselves, it's not a very authoritarian system. If the citizens are chaotic and self-indulgent, the law has become more and more repressive. Um, marriage, family, property, the education of my children, I can't do all these things on my own and I can't do them when somebody else can come and harm me in any way they want because there's no law. There has to be the rule of law for any sort of stability to develop a decent society. Now, Athens had a very complex society and it tried to cultivate people beyond mere survival. I mean, you have to have laws just as survive, right? You can't steal somebody's stuff. You can't shoot people. But you can also have institutions like the agora and the private symposia and the juries and the assembly. We had all of these additional institutions and layers of culture. But because we had them, we depended on each other even more. And we depended on uh, running the legal system, taking turns. So we depended on each other to act on the basis of reason and the rule of law. We couldn't, you know, there was nobody else who could do it but the citizens as a body, as a whole. The more developed, okay, the more it needs these institutions. But that was why, which the, was pointed out in the dialogue, I never left Athens. I stayed there because Athens was a better place to be. Like, why would I want to go visit some city state just to look at the tourist attractions or what? What, they have a fancy mountain or something? I mean, Athens had the, the highest level of civilization. Why wouldn't I want to, as soon as I get off work, why wouldn't I go to the Agora and talk to people about public affairs? I mean, it was such a wonderful system. It was, it was such a privilege. And it was a privilege that I had that almost no one who had ever lived before or at the time had. It's like, why would I go somewhere else? Um, I could have left, but I didn't want to leave, right? Um, and I agreed. If I choose to stay, I have to accept whatever decisions, right? I loved the system, the system of trial by jury. I loved the laws and institutions that were set up before by our ancestors. The problem was the corruption of the people who applied the laws to a specific case. For the, so for someone to accuse me of corrupting the youth and that, that was, the problem was the souls of the people in the jury and the souls of the people that spread false rumors. But you can't make a law. You can't make a law that says you can't even think about this. You cannot feel this way. You cannot have these desires. All it can say is we set up trial by jury to respect people, to believe that they can judge on the basis of reason. Um, and that's, that's another point. Why didn't I bring in my kids? Because it's insulting. Because the whole system is set up for you not to judge on the basis of pity. Everybody on the jury knew I had little kids. But my apology 
my argument was my way of life. And I think my way of life is the very best way to live, to be a good citizen and to preserve a democracy. And I did not apologize for that. I was, it was an affirmation, not only of my life, but of the life of a democratic citizen that honors the rule of law. And so, um, so of course I would abide by the decision, right? So here are my answers to Crito. Yes, you will lose a friend, but you'll always remember me and you'll remember me as somebody who followed reason, right? People will think I was too cheap. It doesn't matter what people think. It matters what's right. Your friends are willing to get into trouble and be heroes. No, that's not true. Uh, we'll be all perceived as irresponsible, self-centered hypocrites that claim to care about something, but when push comes to shove, they buy their way out of it like everybody else. There are other places to go. No, there are no other places to go. That's very important. When you have children, um, this is the big problem, right? If you have children, that was his number six. Um, well, first of all, even as an individual, there's no places to go. If you run, even if I had no kids, if I run away to Europe, to a well-run city, they'll, they'll find me and send me back, right? If the only place I can go is to some barbaric place and just sort of hang out in the forest, like, <laughs> that's not a life. That's not a human life. Um, so there really isn't anywhere to go. There isn't anywhere for anyone to go. So everyone living in a society should realize it's important to them that their society has a good set of laws and institution and that the leaders do not abuse their power. So there should always be dissidents. There should always be people speaking out and risking. Now in the world, in Russia, in Belarus, there are lots of people speaking out against abuses of authority, and that is good. It's the only way to avoid having human beings live like slaves, right? So, but they always have to know there's nowhere to run. So everybody has to keep working on keeping their system honest. Um, you're playing into the hands of the enemies. Look, your enemies are gonna criticize you no matter what you do, if I abide by the decision, see, he admits he's a criminal. If I run away, see, he's a criminal. I mean, you can't win. So you just forget it. And you say, what does reason tell me? You're betraying your children. Okay. Um, this is the one I felt the worst about. You can ignore this 250 word essay, okay? It doesn't have to be that, right? It could be something else. That's an old assignment. Um, but this is what I felt worst about, right? As soon as you have children, what are you supposed to do? On the one hand, if you speak out against the authorities, your children could suffer, right? They could get demonized, criticized, harmed. People can you know, one way to go after a dissident is to go harm their kids. That's one way to silence somebody. Then um, the other way is, and, and of course my kids, they were young, I had one teenager, but um, sure, people were saying, your dad is a jerk, right? Or your dad is a really good guy. I mean, of course, whenever you're in the public eye, your children are affected by it. But if you don't do anything, if you say, no, nope, I'm just gonna put up and shut up so my kids can have, well, then your society falls apart. And then your children have to grow up with a, you know, a collapsed society. And then they're gonna say, dad, why didn't you speak up? Like if you knew it was falling apart, why didn't you say something? 
And then you say, oh, but I did it for your sake. And then, well, what do you mean? Now I have this authoritarian society. So, you know, it's hard. It's a judgment call. So every day you say, how much am I going to speak out? And how much am I going to adjust for my children's sake, right? So that's, that's a toughie. But at the end of the day, I depended on Crido to raise my kids and my other friends. The trouble is, what is Crido going to tell my children? This is a problem. Is Crido going to say, yeah, I gave your dad a chance. You could have grown up in Thessaly and now you're an orphan and your dad's a jerk. It's like, Crido, is he really, I, you know? Or is he going to say, okay, I gave your dad a chance. He wanted you to be here in Athens so that you could participate in the life of a citizen. He thought it was a better place for you to be. And he was willing to die so that you could live in Athens. Um, you know, and Crito could say your dad was a very honorable guy, like, but I don't have any control over that. So I had to hope for the best. Um, all right. So there's that. So you break into groups. Who do you agree with? Should Socrates have escaped? And also, which arguments do you think were the best? Which were Crito's best arguments? And which were his worst arguments? Which were Socrates' best arguments for, for staying and which was his worst argument? And then uh, what are you going to do if you were convicted of a crime unjustly? What would you do, right? Um, which of the arguments seem most convincing to you? And what can you do to lower the chances that you or anyone is unjustly convicted? What can you do to raise the possibility that you or your friends would be convicted unjustly, right? So these are the things that I would like you to think about in your breakout groups. Um, are there any questions before I put you into those groups? Okay, so go for it. Um, is two groups... I'm gonna start with two groups. If anybody has an opinion that they'd like the groups to be smaller, right? And I, they'd like me to put into three, just let me know. But usually my inclination is that you gotta have a certain number of people to keep it going. But if, you, if we have a lot of talkers in this class, everybody should get a chance to just talk it out. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. So I'll put in two for starters. Um, and I'll switch things around a little bit to make sure each class has approximately the same number of um, people from each place. Okay, Aiden, Destiny. Okay, we've got an extra, oh, we got too many, uh, too many, um, Americans in the second group. Um, I'll put a uh, put you over there. Okay, so talk. Oh, Rossi. Okay, where should I put I, you? I, I kept getting disconnected, Professor. I'm sorry. Wow. That's okay. It's not your fault. Let me see. Um, My gosh, we got talkers everywhere. Um, I guess I'll put you in the second one, although we have a lot of talkers. Okay. Jamie, are you okay? Can you get in? Felipe. Maybe disconnected, but there we are. 
Jamie, are you? Let's see. I think you're in group one, if you can get there. So, so Liam is going to be the spokesperson for group one, but if you think Liam left something out, say it or, you know, forever hold your peace. And then the people from the other group, if you have a question to ask, please speak up. Okay. Okay, Liam, go for it. Yeah, so our group kind of collectively agreed from like a logical, like de facto standpoint Plato was right, uh, strictly through his, um, what's like, I don't know why it's hard for me to explain, but he wanted to stand with the justice system and to, I guess, stick with what he believed in, like stay with what he had followed and continue his doctrines from uh, the time they were formed to his death instead of going against them and admitting that uh, what he believed in or uh, being democracy and justice were wrong because of the corruption. So he'd rather uh, die honorably than live with dishonor. Um, but then we kind of played de devil's advocate and we're like, yeah, but he doesn't have to go with a corrupt system because even as like um, Giovanni said, even five in a million unjustly accused is still way too many. So it would still be good to escape the situation. And I think the issue that all philosophy raises is that no one doctrine can apply to all situations. And of course, in this specific situation where you can be falsely accused, never truly will be settled because you will either go against an unjust system and prove that it is wrong or keep going with it and it will never get fixed. Anybody else wanna? Okay, Liam, tell me. If you were one of the Kennedy kids, right? Big, or, you know, big family got accused of rape, okay? This was, I don't know, 20 years ago. And there was a big debate about two things they could do. One of them was, we'll just tell the kid he has to get his own lawyer and be responsible, right? You got yourself into this trouble, you get out. Or get the most expensive lawyer, you know, and get him off, right? Because you can afford it. Okay, what about if it were the case that every time a rich person in our country got arrested, that they could escape from prison because they could bribe, bribe the, the prisoner, the warden, and get out? Would, would our democracy be better off? Uh, our democracy would not, would theoretically not be better off because the rich and powerful will always maintain their, uh, I guess, grip on the, or their grip on their own freedom, where others have their right to vote stripped strictly because they were stealing food for their family when they were 14 years old and trying to feed 11 mouths when all they could do was just what they could to survive. Um, it's always going to be an issue, no matter whether it's democracy or a communist or fascist state, there's always going to be issues with the justice system. And especially with, I'd say an American or the American justice system, where if you are accused and convicted of any crime, you lose your right to vote. And then you can no longer work to uh, fix the system. 
it is always going to skew towards not only those that can afford um, the richest lawyer, but also those that can afford not to break the rules. Right. Uh, but then the question is, would it be better if you also could just bribe a warden and escape? Well, yeah, it would be good for the people that get off. Um, money is has always been power, and it still is. But I mean, I think the democracy would be even worse because it would be that much more obvious that nobody cares. Yeah. That's, that's my question. Would it be better if wardens were bribable? I think, I think he... I think he agrees with you. He's just saying it'll be better for like, oh, okay. it'll, it'll be better for the people that, that do their bribing, you know, like that get off. Like, obviously they're not going to go to jail, so it'll be better for them. But for the others and for the country or for whatever else, is it'll be bad. So I think he agrees with you. He's just saying like, it'll, be, it'll only be better for the people that get away, you know? Okay. That's, that's what I was getting at. Uh, go ahead. Um, I'm pretty sure, because I remember we talked about this in my government class, is once you finish your sentence for a felony and all your crime and your all of your um, fines and everything are paid off, you your right to vote is automatically restored. You just have to make sure you complete your sentence and everything. So even if you did commit a crime at, say, 14, and if you get out of jail and you finish paying off your fines and everything, you have the right to vote again. It's just temporary doesn't suspended. That, doesn't I that say. vary in the state? No. No. Okay. It doesn't. Because I know in Texas there was an issue where a woman thought she had done everything and she ended up with five years in prison but um, I think that was one of the things that we were because I was um when we were in because I was in Texas Gov because I lived in the state of Texas it was one of the conversations we had about is once everything's completely finished you need to make sure everything is finished though but once everything's completely finished and you're cleared you basically have the right to vote again after you complete everything but I do know that jury is a little bit different I think you have to be pardoned by a judge to serve on a jury so that's okay. one thing. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I, and that's true. I, that crossed my mind when you said that. But the bigger issue is, what are we going to do about keeping our system as honest as possible? That's really the question. Are, I mean, can it get more corrupt and more corrupt and more corrupt? Or do you just say the rich will always wrap the system around their finger or are we going to hold them accountable to as much as we can that's that's just an open question um does anybody from the second group want to ask liam something or does thomas want to say what you guys decided and then you can then open it up uh, I, I can go ahead and start a kind of say what we discussed, because I don't think we came to a joint decision. We definitely had, uh, I'd like to say, think about two sides. Um, our, our joint decision about the strength of the arguments at first was, because um, that's what we started with, was that Credo's argument about um, how it would look on his friend's part, like how they would seem almost like bad friends if they didn't help him escape, or how they'd seem poor and not wealthy if they didn't help him escape. Is definitely his weakest argument. We we all agreed on that, and we also agreed that his kind of uh, call to Socrates to think about his kids was his strongest argument for different reasons. Um, I, I think we all looked at it from a different angle, but we all agreed that that's what drew Socrates to the to the point where he actually had to really consider what he was doing. But uh, then we moved on to whether we thought that Socrates was right in his decision to not escape. We had two sides. Um, about half of us thought, yeah, he was correct in his decision. He should have stayed. That made his point clear. It stuck to his beliefs. And it, in turn, if not directly, indirectly, helped strengthen the system of Athens and was going to help him, at least in his mind. It was the right decision in his mind. And we had one half say that, no, that was an incorrect decision. It was unjust to his kids. It was unjust to his family and unjust to, uh, to the world to just take him out of it and not let him keep speaking out and that led us to uh, discussing what we thought would happen if he did escape what would he do you know would he just sit outside the countryside you know sitting on wine and thinking about the rest of his life or would he continue to try to dissent and raise up all these questions and pester everybody around him so uh, we had some people say that he would continuously 
talk about Athens and try to strengthen it. And uh, we had some people believe that he would not be able to do that. And I think the last question we discussed before um, the breakout room ended was whether we would even think about Socrates today if he didn't die. I mean, would we even consider what he said or consider his responses if he had decided to escape on a boat and live the rest of his life out in the middle of nowhere in Greece or just somewhere else? Would his impact have been so strong on us that, you know, thousands of years later, we're still talking about him? And uh, we were, some people believe that, yes, he would still be remembered for what he said because his ideas and beliefs were that powerful. But I think some of us, at least I believe that we would not be talking about Socrates if he hadn't decided to stick with what democracy decided and stick with what the jury had decided. But that's where we were when we left off. And I, I, hopefully, I think I represented the group well. If not, they can feel free to overturn anything I said. Okay, so now I want to hear from some AUW students uh, because I really am curious. You you live in different countries than the U.S., right? So, do you have a country that claims to be a democracy, but it's not really? And how do you deal? What is the rule of law like in your country? Do the people on top actually follow it? Or how does it get corrupted? Or not? Come on. <laughs> Professor? Yes. Um. I think I would say that Indonesia claim um, uh, we are a democratic country, right? This is um, Indonesia, have, guys. Indonesia, yeah. yeah, yeah. But but um, I think that the one who follow the law is just the meet just the ordinary ordinary people or um, the middle class people. But the high class, like people who have money, they they never follow the, the law and how the rules and everything even the people in the government itself um like it just happened i think yesterday um there is one celebrity in indonesia and he get um he got accused for raping a minor but but he get free just for like a week i guess and people like celebrating for his freedom. So it doesn't make sense. Like how, and then after that, another celebrity um, also, also capture because they use um, marijuana or drugs. Oh, I'm sorry. And, um, and also, I'm sorry, <laughs> there, there's some... so a celebrity used drugs. Yeah, and then also like after it's not more than a month and they also get free from the jail. Yeah. When, uh, but when ordinary people like us uh, try to defend ourselves, uh, it's another case. Uh, they try to defend themselves because they get robbed in on the way home and accidentally kill the robber because of uh because him tried to defend himself and his girlfriend but then this student get sentenced to to get in the jail for his entire life yeah it just it just because he tried to defend himself he got robbed so what else can he do except try to defend him, defending himself, right? Yeah, I think that's. <laughs> okay, so when I was in Indonesia, that was uh, 2012, um, Indonesia ranked, I think, 111th in corruption, right out of 170 or something like that. So I used to read about the cases. Um, but what I told the Indonesian students then was, this is their generation, they were 20, is the first generation in Indonesia to actually live when there are elections 
and and they get you know they take turns right one person uh, wins and one loses because before that they had in the name of democracy they had these two very authoritarian leaders or you know so um so I told them not to get discouraged because they're just starting and so they would read about this corruption I said well first of all you have laws right you have laws and when these people misbehave they do get arrested and then you have a free uh free journalism right you have you have journalists who are reporting it so on the one hand it's distressing but on the other hand they didn't even used to have a free press and um who knows if they had the rule of law so it's important not to get too discouraged and it's important just to keep your society honest and it's important to know if you're heading in the right direction or not as soon as you give up as soon as you become cynical, the rich, powerful, corrupt just get more of what they want. So it's always a mistake to say they're all corrupt because then you don't even acknowledge any effort that somebody in power, somebody with money is making to try to make the society better. So you need to acknowledge every effort that's positive and then also call out the negative. But as soon as you aren't paying attention, you the bad guys just take over, right? So that would be my advice as an old lady. It always annoys me when people say they're all corrupt. That's not true. In my country, there are significant differences between the different political leaders. Um, all right. So what I think I want to do, if that's all right, anybody else want to talk though, before I start in, what I'm gonna do is go back to that slideshow, the different kinds of corruption. And I'm gonna ask you, you know, to write down some stuff and I'm gonna put you back in groups. So pay attention. Um, anybody else wanna clock in about should he run away or not? Um, I think here's an open question. Um, especially in America, because supposedly we were the country that was a constitutional government that was based on the rule of law at the time that was so innovative. We were so progressive. We were the ultimate liberals. Our founders were religious heretics, political revolutionaries. They killed their founding fathers, they, you know, they replaced everything with something new. And um, now this is not what we are, we've changed. And so um, I just want you to, Americans need to think about, do American citizens really respect the rule of law? Open question, right? Because I might agree with you if you say no and give a good reason. I might agree with you if you say yes and give, give a good reason. So I'm not going to, you know, it's not an argument that you get in with me. It's an open question. And it's a question you have to ask every single day. Do I think Americans still honor the rule of law? Um, and then there's all the corruptions that go on. So again, with Untari, with Indonesia or with Rasi, is it still possible to, to um, piece together the rule of law? Can it survive? Can we, you know, because the alternative is authoritarianism. It's <laughs> like, ah, you might be almost drowning, but you're not dead yet. So I would advocate for the rule of law. Um, all right, so let's go. I'm going to go to, um, now I can't, again, I keep not, be, oh yeah, all right, go up here, go up here. Um, nope. Can, let's see, can the AUW students see this? Yes, Professor. Okay. That is not the best way to go, however, but all right, I get to scroll all the way down. I just, Keep forgetting how to get out of the one into the other, but 
Um, okay, so let's go back to Athens. Here we are. And I'm gonna stop once in a while and have you, oh boy. Now I have to figure out how to make it full screen. Let's see. Does anybody know which button I'm You can supposed? present it. You you can click on present present is next that? to the share. Next to next the share, share button on here? top. Oh, okay. Top All right. right. Okay. Thanks. All right. So I Plato, I wrote these dialogues to pass down. Uh, both tales of how we set up our democracy and how we destroyed it. And I knew that people who have enough education, if you have the opportunity to read my dialogues, you may, it means you're naturally smart, you had a, the opportunity to get an education, and therefore you will exercise some kind of authority in your lifetime. Uh, so this is a warning and an inspiration. I want to tell you the kinds of institutions we had that you might say, that's a good idea. We need to add this to make our democracy better. Or we've got that institution, but uh-oh, <laughs> we better not corrupt it or we're corrupting it. We need to uh, change course, right? We need to do a correction. So here you go. Anybody can benefit. So what did we have? We had the value of uh, thinking that the gods expect us to use our reason. We're supposed to take these, this desire to live for the sake of something greater than ourselves. We're supposed to take our awareness of higher powers and use that to live a life that makes life better for human beings. We're not supposed to watch human beings suffer and say it must be God's will. No, unite reason and faith, okay? Then um, order and proportion. You should live an ordered life. You should expose yourself visually to things that are ordered and proportionate to always remind yourself, I need to live an ordered life in order to have an ordered society. It's not just a personal issue. The order inside of me is going to project outward to other people. Every relationship I have will either fall apart because I overreact or it will be orderly and it will be a well, long-term, I'll be a trustworthy person, I'll be a good friend, all that matters. Um, Here's the courthouse. Right next to the uh, temple to Athena is the courthouse. This is where we live out. Athena wants us to, to engage in justice and wisdom, to develop wisdom. Then we have the theater. Oh, all those lousy emotions. Um, all right, so how did the courthouse get corrupted? It got corrupted when people paid money to learn how to use rhetoric, to manipulate juries and the assembly, and then people on the jury expected to be manipulated. They lost track of what the point of that was, which is learning how to think like a citizen, learning how to use your reason. So right next to the temple to Athena, you have these corruptions going on and people did not even think it was corrupt. The next one, the theater, we have lots of awful emotions and we have to flush them out. Now, what happened in my country to corrupt this? People really didn't think that the educational system was designed to flush out that stuff. They thought it was just describing people. Well, people are like that. That's why, you know, we have all these power struggles instead of if you have power, you shouldn't do this. Okay, so here's a question. If you can use example from your own country, how is it that a piece of art that 
I'll give you a, some alternatives. A piece of art that you think the artist was trying to flush something out. The artist talks about something irrational, shows you how, what a terrible result it has, trying to convince you indirectly not to do that, not to feel that way. Um, so it was intended to be educational, but the way people uh, interpret it and talk about it, it is not having that influence. It's justifying cynicism or whatever. So you might think of an example where the artist's intention to educate is corrupted because the people will not be educated. Here's another kind of corruption. Do you have people in your society who really get called artists, but they're really just entertaining you, distracting you, making you feel pleasure so they'll make money? Are they creating these fantasies, right? So that you feel good and you give them money and glory? Or are there artists that are feeding irrational fears um, and promoting a certain political agenda? Because if you, you know, blow up a fear and then you attach it to one political party is gonna protect you from this fear, that's a political agenda. So do artists ever uh, corrupt their skill and turn what could be educational into political propaganda? So that's one, that's what was happening in Athens, right? Okay, so do you have a, a educational system that sets up for overall wellness, right? For teaching the populace uh, about diet, exercise, you have physical education classes, but people just um, are ignoring it. They're getting fat and lazy and they're eating all the wrong stuff and it's costing the government money. Do you have doctors that would rather make money on rather, right, make money on being heart specialists or diabetes specialists rather than just telling people stop smoking, stop eating junk food and get some exercise. Do you have a corruption of medicine? Do you have a corruption of the arts? Do some people who could make artwork that's beautiful and ordered and crafted and people go to their homes and they feel the sense of focus, the sound mind and a sound body, they use that to create things that um, are undermined, right? That appeal to irrational emotions, to excess emotions, to lust, to greed, um, to power fantasies. And people put this stuff in their houses and it just feeds their irrational fantasies. Um, when you go to the agora, this could be social media, right? Whenever you gather with people and online or in person, do you think carefully before you speak? Do you use that opportunity to cultivate your reasoning powers? Do you teach, do you dedicate yourself to trying to think like a citizen? What is a good policy? How do we keep a middle class? Or do you take advantage of that just to say whatever you feel like saying or to say something that will outrage somebody or to say something that will make you popular give you more followers, give you more, make you more of an influencer, whatever. So what do you do? And what do you think, how are you going to move it in the direction of a large middle class and a more stable society? Um, let's see, that's enough. That's enough, I think. So why don't you get back in your groups? Whoops. Um, stop the share. Okay, I'm going to put you back in groups. You got another 15 minutes. I think after 10 minutes or so, I'll, I'll bring you back and um, take questions and sort of wrap it up. And then the next time you read a, a little 25 pager Aristotle's ethics. So there's various virtues. And I'll ask you, does Socrates seem to have these virtues? And then 
Jesus, Mohammed, Buddha, whoever you look up to, or some secular humanist that you look up to, do they live a life that includes these various virtues? That's where we're going next time. But let me put you in groups right now about um, the institutions of democracy, uh, how they promote citizenship, and then if your country is corrupting these or not. Um, okay.